1992 can be seen as the end of an era. Apple discontinued the Apple II GS, bringing an end to the Apple II series after 15 years in which it shaped computing. Commodore released its final system, the Amiga 1200, a machine that due to having its development staff fired, wasn't the giant leap in technology that the Amiga 1000 was. Although still a capable computer on its own, it would soon fade into the background, mismanaged into oblivion by a company unworthy of its greatness. A struggling publisher called Mediagenic, formerly known as Activision, was taken over by an investment group led by one Robert Kotick and put back on the path of becoming one of the most important publishers in the video games industry. Microsoft released the first version of Windows that anyone really cared about, Windows 3.1. And CDs were about to hit the mainstream with the international release of the Philips CDI and the release of the Sega CD add-on for the Genesis and Mega Drive. It may have been the end of an era, but a new one was dawning now. If you've enjoyed the music on the background of this series for the past six months, you've got Dune to thank for that. Released in 1992, Dune was a strange mix of a game created by the French studio Cryo Interactive. It was part point-and-click adventure, part cinemaware Amiga game and part real-time strategy. You'd be traveling the planet Arrakis trying to muster together the Fremen to produce enough spice in order to satisfy the Emperor's will, all the while working in secret to turn the desert green and create a fighting force capable of taking down the Harkonnen and the Emperor's own Sardaukar as well. It was a magnificent title that managed to not really fit any genre per se, instead making a name for itself as its own type of game. 1992 also brought us the excellent RPG Darklands made by Microprose that aimed to eschew some of the usual attributes of the genre. It did have fantasy elements in it, but the game was set in a very solid historical context with real-world locations covering a big stretch of Central Europe and letting the player do as they pleased through the world in an attempt to basically stop the devil. This was a fantastic year for game sequels. Some of the oldest series in the industry getting up to the sixth iteration in the case of King's Quest, fourth in the case of Might and Magic, and seventh in the case of Wizardry with its Crusaders of the Dark Savant, this actually being the last Wizardry to be made in this millennium. It was also when the seventh Ultima game was released, The Black Gate a landmark title that took the concept of open world and just blew it up by adding to it, well, a world with a level of believability to it so deep that it let you do things like lighting a candle and putting them out as you saw fit throughout the world. Or you could basically move anything that wasn't nailed down and actually use those objects, for example, to make a ladder and get to places that you didn't think you could in a 2D game. You could even bake bread by combining flour with water and turning it into dough and then putting it into an oven. This is just a tiny example that exemplifies the core idea at the heart of Ultima 7, that this was the world of Ultima, one in which people lived. It wasn't just a place that existed solely for the player's benefit. And it also signaled the beginning of a new age, the age of Armageddon, both in the context of the video game itself and the game's world and the Ultima lore, as well as in the real life as well, because Origin Systems, due to it not being able to secure loans, for reasons that have been deemed as being quite shifty at the time, was bought out by Electronic Arts. The displeasure of the people at Origin for this event is quite evident in Ultima 7, where the logo of Electronic Arts can be quite clearly seen tied very much to the main villains of the game. The same idea of freedom, of interaction, of a real world with real characters that you just visited was also at the core of another Ultima game, released that year. Made by a small studio called Blue Sky Productions at the time, there came the game called Ultima Underworld. While having the same idea as Ultima 7 of representing a lived in world, it went a few steps further. It wasn't a top-down game. 
you are inhabiting a single character from a point of view often seen before in many dungeon crawling games. The first person perspective. Only here you wouldn't be crawling through a dungeon, instead you'd be trying to learn about this world. You'd be talking to its inhabitants instead of just killing everybody like a maniac the moment you saw them. That was valid even for the rats not just the humans, but if you wanted to be a maniac and kill everybody, yeah you could, and the story would still progress. It was meant to be a reactive world that immersed you in the experience of it, and it did so by simulating everything it could. Your character had physical properties, you'd bounce off walls when you jump, and even though the characters were 2D sprites, they still respected the logic, the internal logic of this world, a world that was 3-dimensional as much as possible for that age. It behaved more like a flight simulator in the way you moved rather than a dungeon crawler where progression meant just quickly jumping from one square to another with a very very jarring sense of motion. Ultima Underworld set the groundwork for a genre called the immersive sim, a genre that aimed to put you in the game's world completely, and it tried to not break the illusion that this was all real, that you were not in a video game. And in that way it was similar to the cinematic platformer idea, but taken one step further by removing the cinematic aspect of it, the non-interactive aspect of it I mean. It gave you the keys to the world and told you to keep them tight because somebody's gonna steal them one day. Ultima Underworld managed to do all that with just one tiny part of the screen at a very low frame rate because the 486s of the age could not really do better, whereas if you wanted something more simplistic in terms of gameplay, with just traveling around some really well made 2D levels shooting Nazis, well then you had Wolfenstein 3D. It's software's first claim to fame in the FPS genre that it had a hand in slowly defining. According to legend, Wolf 3D exists as it does because John Carmack saw a really slow version of Ultima Underworld at a trade show one day and said that he could make it faster. That's probably not true, but Wolf 3D was indeed faster, although unable to draw anything other than simple rectangles and sprites. Technologically, it was in the Stone Age compared to Ultima Underworld, and it did a little to resemble its predecessors, the older Wolfenstein games being based more on stealth, which was something that couldn't really be added in Wolfenstein 3D due to its limitations. But in terms of sheer fun, it was easy to grasp and engaging thanks to its level design, setting the stage for something that would blow the socks off everybody within a year. Another sequel to come out of that year was the excellent adventure game Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, proof that there can be fantastic games based on films or at least on film properties, not necessarily a certain movie. This was a game that managed to encapsulate the joy of that movie series and an adventure that offered more choice than seemed obvious at first, the player having the ability to decide how to play, how to solve the puzzles, which was something rare back then, and it had a story that everybody wished would have been turned into the fourth Indiana Jones movie, but sadly it wasn't. And who would have believed that within two years the people at Toys for Bob managed to turn a simplistic 2D space combat game into probably the greatest space adventure ever created, and one of the best games ever made in general. This was Star Control 2, one of the few video games that has done alien creatures and interaction right, and mind you, this was also the year when we got the only properly good, properly Star Trek game in the form of Star Trek the 25th Anniversary Adventure Game. And it was nothing compared to this. Star Control 2 was inspired in part by Starflight from 1986, with which it also had a bit of developer overlap. This game put you in the shoes of the Captain of Humanity's Last Hope, a ship built by a race so advanced that one of their throwaway space trucks outmatched most warships and you were commanding that space truck, flying across the galaxy, collecting allies, making friends, making enemies, and involving yourself in a complicated and ongoing in real-time political system that makes most other space games look bland by comparison. And when I say real-time, I mean real-time. Depending on how fast you acted, you could have had very different interactions with, well, let's say, what was left 
of the species that you encountered. And one last sequel that we truly need to talk about in the year 1992 is that of a game that we've already discussed about 5 minutes ago. Both games released within the same year, and neither is starting development with the knowledge of the other. This was Dune 2, the game that put Westwood on the map. Well, it was on the map already because of Eye of the Beholder and a few other games, but this planted a flag on the map so tall that everybody took notice. This was the birth of the RTS genre. While there have been plenty of games with real-time controls over units, Dune 2 defined exactly what the formula of the RTS is. Unit production, resource gathering and management, technological progression and combat to no end. Paired with a killer soundtrack and an environment that was out to kill you as much as the enemy was, Dune 2 became the game to copy, at least by part of the gaming industry until 1993 rolled along. And speaking of a game that would be copied to death and back, Infogrames brought us the seminal survivor horror game Alone in the Dark. A mixture of action and adventure in a world that mixed 3D with 2D with fixed camera angles, tank-like controls for characters and a heavy focus on needing to carefully explore the environment in order to avoid death. It was a marvelously horrifying experience for its time and, with time, its simplistic graphics only made it scarier because you had no idea what those models were supposed to be. Though maybe it was not as visually frightening as Darkseed though. An adventure game made by Cyber Dreams based on the art of H.R. Giger, exploring the depths of madness to which people can descend for one while trying to solve its puzzles, and then because, well, at the time, it was a very visually disturbing game, and it still is, giving a lot of people nightmares as any good horror game should do. This was also the year when we got Night Trap, which wasn't a horror game, but it did bring about the horror of mandatory video game age ratings, and was seen by many in the media and in the US government as a sign that all the evils of the world can be traced back to video games, to some awkward full motion video game that was, for the most part, harmless. And when Night Trap wasn't enough, these people set their eyes on a new fighting game that was just eating up all the attention. Mortal Kombat was developed by Midway with the initial idea of making a blood sport game starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. But when that idea fell through, they stuck with the concept of using digitized images of real-life actors to create a fighting game that didn't look as cartoony as Street Fighter, but kicked just as much ass, probably more in a literal sense and many other body parts as well, even removing them, ripping them apart, crushing them and in general being as bloody as possible. Mortal Kombat kicked the arcade scene into high gear with pure spectacle, encouraging the participation of others to resolve the mystery of what was the correct button combo for making a fatality. That was part of the game's brilliance. It encouraged the development of a community around itself through that mystery. It's a game that may not be as respected in terms of tournament pedigree as Street Fighter 2, but it was a game for the masses which spawned a series that seems to have no end. It even spawned a bunch of movies. One of them was okay. In the less violent realms, we also had the first in the Kirby series. Kirby's Dreamland, a joyful platformer starring a cuddly ball of yet undetermined color that swallowed up everything it could and used it to traverse the environment. In a similar kind of genre, we also got Delphine Software's follow-up to another world in the form of Flashback, a cinematic platformer that proved that the Amiga still had bite to it even though Commodore was getting ready to run for the hills. And lastly, one final game that I believe is worth mentioning is Silicon and Synapse's Lost Vikings, a platformer that let you control three characters and required you to use all of them to find your way through levels that involved well, an alien spaceship for one. As for what was the game of 1992, well... This has got to be the most difficult decision in the show so far, because I kid you not when I say that some of these were the greatest games ever made for their time, and some are still some of the best possible games ever designed. But taking into account what best defined that year, and what left the biggest impact on the industry, I have to say that the title has to go to Ultima Underworld. It did first 
third-person gaming and 3D world design at a level that no one managed before it. It was a technological marvel that wasn't equaled for years to come by other first-person games. It pushed the limits of what was possible in terms of graphics, physics, character interaction, world reactivity, and set a standard for something that we still crave and try to do pretty much every year. A total immersion experience, at least that's what it was back then. One that was emulated, re-implemented, remade, redesigned, and in general reused by just about every first-person game since. Whereas, let's face it, the industry and the public at large have given up on the RTS. But make no mistake, most of the games that you've seen today you should have played by now. If you truly want to understand great game design, go out and play all of them because they are amazing. Apart from Night Trap, maybe not that one. So closes the year 1992. Next week, we're all doomed. Goodbye.